Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here to share some of the excitement I see in some cyber infrastructure that we call NanoHub. By the way, I'm not the founder, I'm the director right now. Mark Lundstrom was the founder some 11 years ago. But about 10 years ago, I decided to leave California, the best coast, to uh, come back to Purdue after I got my PhD here a decade before. So what you see here on the screen is activity on the cyber infrastructure that many people deemed impossible. I'll explain the specs and all that, but basically you look at the log of activity on NanoHub in uh, a week of February of this year. And uh, really what this is about is uh, trying to, sh uh, to transfer knowledge from research into other people's hands. And so you, that is what we wanted to achieve and that's what, what NanoHub is about. And do that in a cyber infrastructure that allows everybody to run it in a web page. And uh, as we moved forward with this, with these plans and grew from almost nothing to over 200,000 users, there were a bunch of myths that were put in front of us where people told us, well, you can't do this, you can't do that. So I'm going to show you some of these myths and what was, uh, why they there were there and what we wanted to overcome and uh, then show you again how we measure success. I can't tell you all the solutions, but I can tell you the problems and the final results. So with that, I'm working in nanotechnology. So when, when you think nanotechnology, you might think people in bunny suits and maybe working on little chips. And maybe you think of the Berg Nanotechnology Center we have here at Purdue, which is an extensive facility. You might even have heard of quantum, um, of carbon nanotubes like these that are very strong, or you might have heard of quantum dots that are like artificial atoms that people, people can actually build. So these are sort of conceptual models, but these models actually also run in a big computer, and big computers we have here at Purdue. In fact, we have some 30,000 cores available to do computation. These computations are conducted by computational scientists, and we work on these models on these computers, but what you may not know is that there's a big wall between the experimentalists and the theorists. And you wonder whether you could overcome that wall. In fact, you might want to think about giving those tools to an experimentalist so they can understand the experiments better. But that would have to run in a web because they don't install software. So that means in the first place, you have to have somebody actually, uh, of us, the computational guys, actually put that stuff on the web. And uh, that's kind of hard to do. And maybe you want to validate all of your models with your own community and really engage a lot of people that are computationalists and maybe you want to impact a lot of experimentalists down the line. So that's one thing to go overcome barriers, but there's more barriers. Can you possibly dream of using that stuff in education? Can you actually change education? And can you be useful for industry? Because ultimately we want to have jobs that are out there in the future, right? So, so but why is this so hard? It's a, it's a common dream. There's many portals, many science gateways. There's none like NanoHub, which is really, I think, a cool thing. And, um, Let's look at why this is actually very hard. So us computational scientists, we actually don't put stuff on the web. We write models that run well and we write papers. And what most people do is they write code for one person for one person's use, meaning I can most of the time run the codes that my students might be using as an average uh, faculty member. But the point is, what they actually do here is they might have a gobbledygook script, a script, right? Actually, this is well structured as far as I'm concerned, but it's gobbledygook to you, and it would be gobbledygook for an experimentalist. What they really want is something more like this, right? Going from user hostile to something that's usable. So the same gobbledygook can actually look nice like this in an interface where you can model quantum dots. So, so you want to get to user friendly, but the problem is, you can build many user interfaces many different ways, but it's got to be written by us, the computational scientists, because we don't want to hand the stuff off to somebody else. It's expensive. So we got to be developer friendly, and we developed software for that. We call that Rapture. Furthermore, it has to run in the web. So we run, wrote the software for that. That's called Hub Zero now. So that's what we wanted to do. And while we were building all of this, it's been hard, and many people tried similar things. There were some myths that started to exist. And we were being told that you can't do that for education. You can't use research codes for education. And by the way, if you want to do good research, you've got to write your own code. You can't use somebody else's code. And experimentalists won't touch that stuff anyhow. And by the way, it's way too hard to put this on the web. And by the way, why should you do that, right? You write papers. Why would you want to give it to somebody else? So, and also, there was no infrastructure that really allowed 
to disseminate simulation tools very broadly. So let me try to address some of these um, myths. We now have, on, the, on NanoHub, uh, we've engaged over 300 developers that are mostly volunteers. They build over uh, well now 235 tools. They are all interactive. They're not gobbledygook scripts. You can rotate molecules around, et cetera. And this myth that you can't do that is really busted. There's another one that's accessibility. So here's my global map again, right? Uh, apparently this thing is accessible. And um, what, are you, what you're seeing on the map here is really um, the, um, the green spikes are people signing up on the website. The yellow dots are then subsequent simulation user runs. And the red dots are people looking at seminars. And you can sort of see bursts in locations, right? The bigger the dot, the more people come from the same location. So there seem to be patterns of usage. So let's try to understand what that is and see if that is useful for education and research. So I'm looking at sort of a timeline of a user, and that user might show up in multiple days and might run the green tool and the orange tool, and I have lots of users like that, so I have a, like a matrix, you know, like the movie Matrix that runs by, that kind of stuff. So we analyze software and I have analysis software, and we ana analyze the user behavior. So we can categorize that some people behave very similar. In fact, they all come for that one homework assignment that their faculty member gave them. There's not maybe other groups that show up for a whole semester, and they use one particular tool throughout the whole semester. There's other groups that actually use multiple tools in a periodic pattern and come and um, do their homework or their project. I mean, this is the only cyber infrastructure I know where we can actually look at people's behavior and actually measure the classroom size without even knowing what their sign-up rate is, right? We can measure how many people are in a class, we can measure what tools they use. Then we have another class of users that behave completely erratic. Like, there's not, they're not correlated to each other. Those are researchers or self-study users. So let's, let's look at some of this. But basically, by the way, all these tools are research tools, right? And you can't do that, right? You can't use research tools for education. Eh. So now the next thing is, um, how long does it take to do that? So now we can actually measure the publication time of a tool and the first time it shows up in a classroom, right? And you need to compare that to a typical textbook development time of about four years from one revision to the next. And I, I'm plotting this on a very weird axis, starting from years, going down to weeks. So now the question is, how long does it take on NanoHub to deploy and use tools in the classroom? We have 19 tools, excuse me, that have been used within a week of being published on NanoHub. A week, and maybe then uh, one month, etc. Actually, the me median time for adoption is less than six months. And you might say, well, those might be faculty members like you. They create a tool and they, they use it in the classroom. That's true, that's the pink line. But we also see another distribution in there where other faculty members from other universities adopt somebody else's code and move it into their classroom. So um, now let's look at the research guys, right? So how do we measure research? We're um, academics, right? We write papers. So we go in the literature and we find over 800 papers in the uh, scientific literature now. And they cite NanoHub in various forms. These colors mean something. Each dot is a paper. Each line between is a common author. So you see social networks forming outside the inner core. And the inner core is us here at Purdue and, and in, in part of the network. But the cool thing is 77% of the authors are on the outside. Ah. OK, there's other researchers using our stuff, so we transferred it to them. So that's possible. It's not impossible. We can also look at these maps like this, where we can study these papers and look whether there's experimental data in there. And it turns out a significant percentage of these papers have experimental data and even experimentalists on there. So the myth that experimentalists won't ever touch that is busted, right? I can measure it. Not shown here, but just labeled. We actually have uh, about 9% of the papers are co-authored by industrial users. So, so we have industry impacting as well. All right, so last point I want to make is we have tools that seem to be useful for uh, teaching, right? You might think these are teaching tools. We've identified tools that are used for research, and you might think these are mutually exclusive. If you actually fill in the whole uh, thing of 235 tools, we can demonstrate quantitatively that there's tools that are being used for education and for research. And you can't really separate those two. And that's a wonderful thing to actually create new knowledge and let it out from one bucket and let it be used somewhere else. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. 
So we have now an infrastructure here run out of Purdue for the rest of the world, and basically that map sh sort of shows that wherever there's lights on at night, we have nano hub users. That's a pretty cool thing if you think about normally writing a paper that's being read by four people or so, right? So this is quite some impact. So, and it is accessible. It is user friendly. So we have over 12,000 simulation users that actually run these simulation tools. Um, we can prove it's being used in research and in education. And uh, it's developer friendly. We engage people that want to work in there. So they, we don't have to take their code and put it on. They do it themselves. They stay on it. And we developed software that allowed all of that to do. I didn't tell you how that's being done in detail, but you can look it up on the web. So thank you very much.